I've known Brett for uh, many years, actually. I've been a long time cinematographer, known as a cinematographer. I made feature films like Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind and Blow. And I've done many commercials. And in doing that, I met Brett many years ago. We've done uh, numerous projects together. So also, he's asked me to do a pilot for him, which was one of my first forays into TV before I started directing. And so I've become mostly an episodic director of late, doing projects like Ozark and Legion. And uh, so Brett asked me, after we had done a project, he called me up and he said, I'm working on a project with Nat Geo about Jane Goodall and her work. They found all of this new, newly recently discovered archival material in the National Geographic Archives. Would you be interested in coming to do the interviews with the present day Jane? And uh, of course, she's a legend to me and she was one of my role models. So I said, of course. So we went to Tanzania and we, over the course of uh, numerous days, we did these interviews. Brett was a real conceptualist. I mean, he's not, he's not only a nonfiction documentary filmmaker in that sense. He's a, he's a conceptual filmmaker. So the way that he conceptualized doing the interviews is very much based on um, moving during the day. It's almost like a day in the life of Jane Goodall. So we had to create the lighting um, over the course of several days to be as if it was in one day. And he wanted to create the lighting also to fit the mood of what, where we were in the documentary. Interestingly, they're both very different as people, but they're very much based in ideas and meaning. And that's where I, I very much connect with them because as a cinematographer, I always come to my projects thinking about how do I create meaning with the imagery. So for me, making images is about making visual metaphor. And the same thing with, with both of them as filmmakers, both Brett and Errol, um, they're both tempestuous. You know, they're both passionate about what they do, but they're both super intellectuals, which I really attach onto because I really like the idea of talking about ideas and how can, how you film it, be able to say something about what the content is. So for, in Wormwood, it was very much the same idea of me approaching Errol and saying, so in Wormwood, this is a story that is told from many different points of view. It's, it's a story that we'll never know the truth because we can only approximate the truth. So how can we show with the camera how to get closer to that truth by showing the many different points of view, by showing many different angles? And so that's how Wormwood started. And when we talked about going into the stage and filming the idea of what happened in the suicide when the father gets supposedly commits suicide or gets thrown out the window, I said, let's create the stage set to show that. So every time someone tells a story, maybe the wall is shifted 10 feet in a different direction. Maybe, you know, maybe we try to show it in different ways so that the audience can vicariously experience what, what the story is. I have to say I was disappointed that Wormwood didn't get a little bit more of a nod here. I've been in the Television Academy for, since 2010 when I won for my own film. And you know, I've been watching pretty closely. I was really disappointed that it didn't get more of a nod. So I would say that because it deserved it. You know, when I was starting, there were really a handful of women who were out in the field, if maybe three. You know, there was Diana Taylor, there was Cindy, Sandy Sissel, and that was kind of it. You know, there was Caroline Champedier in Paris. Um, so the difference is, is that back then, you know, we didn't have mo role models, and there were very few opportunities. And I think that that's a key thing, is that people didn't have confidence that women could be comfortable in the technical field, that they couldn't um, do what men could do, and that... Uh, they couldn't handle machines, right? You know, it's kind of the, the old, the cultural bias against women in science. And I think that that's changing now a lot. Um, I think that people have been made aware of, of that, especially in the past couple of years, when it's being named in a different way. And I can find for myself as a director now, there are more opportunities. People are looking to diversify. Um, but I have to say, you know, the the cultural biases are hard to change. And you know, it's gonna be a step-by-step -step process. But I think the key is, is 
you know, you know, having the confidence to provide, you know, give opportunity to women. You know, it's not going to happen overnight because if you don't have the experience, you can't get good at what you're doing. So it will take some time for us to see the, the benefits of this. But I think it's important that people are aware, they're starting to open up the opportunities, and they're encouraging. Both nonfiction and fiction cinematographers are dipping into the same toolbox. Um, you know, now that, that anybody can pick up a camera or anybody can you know, then buy a smaller light and use these new LEDs, has really opened up the field in many ways of using the same kinds of um, approaches. I mean, when, when I first started doing uh, dramatic cinematography, I started using tricks that I learned in dramatic cinematography in my nonfiction work. And, but things have changed a lot since I, I started doing a film back in 1985, and that was all film. And it was all double system, meaning that film was separate from the from sound. The fact that you can go out now as a documentary cinematographer and have it all in one package, it's pretty pretty amazing. So you can get you can get material that you never could get before. But you know, now that LEDs have come into play, I mean it's changed the whole landscape. So yes, I you know, now the world is becoming the division isn't so defined.